Heather Gano, everybody. She will be performing stand-up at the Tempe Improv next Sunday night. Very funny. Very good. Very good job. Well, a happy 4th of July to you, the 4th of July remnant, as it were, here this morning, Sunday morning. I am glad uh, to be with you. I just want to pray and open up uh, in a prayer this morning uh, for our country. I think that we have a responsibility as Christians to be praying for our country, specifically our leaders. Lots happening in our world, and on the day when we celebrate uh, the birth of our country and the freedoms that we have, I just find it appropriate for us to just take a moment and pray. So if you would with me, God, we thank you for the ability to gather here this morning freely. We thank you for uh, the privileges and the rights that we do receive by being citizens of this country, but we also recognize, God, that we are by no means a perfect country that we have our flaws, that there is often injustice and uh, all sorts of corruptness and problems that we deal with on a daily basis. And so I just pray, God, for your favor and your divine guidance um, in and through our country. God, protect our leaders, uh, give them revelation and wisdom on how to best lead our country into the future. And also, God, we just come to you with gratitude, gratitude that we get to be a part of this beautiful place and uh, to be able to experience the freedoms that we do have. So on this 4th of July weekend, God, we give you thanks and praise, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, I did a little research, and I found out that statistics show that 52% of car accidents happen within five miles of your home. And, you know, that makes sense after all the five miles that you drive the most are around where you live, right? They, they're there that all the time. You drive them all the time. And not only that, but those streets tend to be low miles per hour. And so uh, you spend even extra time upon them uh, and you're extra familiar with them. And then again, I thought, they, I was sort of thinking and I was like, you know, the statistic does, you know, makes the most sense because, I mean, if you do think of those five miles around your home, you do drive those a lot. But then I got to thinking, they don't really make a lot of sense because they are low miles per hour, right? And you are driving slower and you're super familiar with the area. You should know where the stop signs are, where the stoplights are. And I got kind of confused by it. In addition, because of the familiarity that we have with the five miles of roadways around our home, I think it's true that we're a lot more likely to get distracted, right? Like we're thinking about other things, we're coming home, we're thinking about family, we're going to the grocery store, we're thinking about $10 bananas, which I don't know what kind of bananas you're buying, but you need to probably go shop somewhere else, Heather, I don't know. And so our comfort level with those roads can cause our guard maybe to be let down a little bit and allow for a greater accident risk. The lesson here is this. Your greatest odds for a collision is always closest to your home. Your greatest odds for a collision is always closest to your home. Funny story. I wrote this, uh, that portion on Thursday morning. On Friday afternoon, I got a call from my wife. And she had been rear-ended less than a mile from my house in a car we just bought, no less. Everybody's okay, all right? You know, like I've had to... I've had to have my words, you know, with the mirror about what's going on in my heart, which is not great about all that, but we've dealt with it. But it just, I was just like, wow, like, okay, this is a real thing. Most collisions, at least in a car, happen closest to home. And then I got to thinking, this actually is true beyond car accidents, isn't it? 52% of car accidents happen closest to home. And that, position, that percentage is much higher, though, when I think it comes to the relational collisions that we have in life. I don't have the exact statistics in front of me, but I'm pretty sure somewhere around 98% of our relational collisions happen with those we're closest to. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah. I mean, give or take, right? 98, 99%. I don't know what it is exactly. But I think that this should cue us into something. The vast majority of conflict in your life is going to be with those you're closest to. Yep. That, 
I feel some tension in that. Yeah, I feel like there's some animosity there. They'll be with your parents. They'll be with your children. They'll be with your siblings. They'll be with your closest friends. They'll be with your spouse. And they will even be with the people you're sitting around right now. In fact, you can write this down if you want to and try to remember it. Here's the truth. Close community breeds conflict. You will spend time in conflict with those you're closest to. It's just the way it happens. You you likely don't have a lot of conflict with the acquaintance from work or the friend's friend who happened to join you at lunch, right? You probably don't have serious relational collisions with the cashier at Fry's or the waiter at the restaurant. And if you do, please get therapy, okay? Just go see a therapist. (laughs) But I'll bet you've had plenty of dust-ups when you spend time with family or close friends or even your fellow followers of Jesus at the church. And no one is immune to it, right? Close community will breed conflict. It's part of what it means to be in close community. And it even happens among the heroes of the Bible. And so the question becomes, what in the world do we do when conflict arises in close community? How do we deal with it in a way that is healthy and honoring to the person and to God? Because I think if we're honest with ourselves, we aren't doing all that well in the area of conflict, are we? (laughs) Man, this is a safe place this morning. I like it. It's a safe place. We're just not very good at dealing with conflict. And so we're going to look this morning at a passage in the Bible that actually is going to show us what not to do. So with that in mind, grab your Bible or your YouVersion app and go to, uh, you can go to more and events in the YouVersion app and find all of everything we're going to read along here. Or if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. Teen, and as you find your place, as Heather said, we finish up our Summer Jam series. Did you guys have fun with that Summer Jam series? So much fun to do. Uh, and I look forward to that series every single year. We're going to spend the next two weeks in uh, Acts chapter 15 and starting verse or chapter 16. And then I'm going to be gone for a few weeks. So we're going to have some guest speakers here, Pastor DJ, Pastor Joe, and Pastor Justin Hagee are going to be speaking on Sunday morning. So you're going to want to come back for that. It's going to be great. And then once I get back in at the end of August, we're going to jump right back into the book of Acts. And as Heather said, hopefully finish it before Jesus comes back. But uh, here's before I think pick, pick things at an Acts, it's been about a month since we've been there. So let me just give a brief recap of what has been happening up to this point in the, pack, the text. So there was a long trip of sharing the gospel that Paul and Barnabas went upon uh, throughout the Roman Empire. And they started churches in all of these cities throughout modern-day Turkey. And they've now returned back to Antioch of Syria to take a break. And this, uh, this collision, if you will, this conflict occurs about what is necessary for somebody to receive salvation if they're not Jewish. Do they have to be circumcised? Do they have to follow the Old Testament law? And so this big collision happens. They all go to Jerusalem. They figure it out. They decide, no, that's not what needs to happen. These are some things that everybody needs to abide by. But no matter who you are, you're welcomed into the faith of Jesus Christ just simply by believing. And so there's this wonderful moment of of peace and tranquility among the Christians and those throughout Jerusalem and Judea and all the way up into Antioch of Syria. And then as soon as that's over, and some time passes, I'm sure, we get to Acts chapter 15, verses 36 through 38. And before this happens, Paul seems to get this itch to go back on the road. And this is what happens starting in verse 36. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing. Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Okay, pause there. I want us to go back a couple chapters. This There's something going on here that Luke is referring to, an instance that Paul is against bringing John Mark because of. So in Acts chapter 13, 
Paul and Barnabas head out on their first missionary trip throughout the Roman Empire. And here's what it says in Acts 13, verses 4 through 5. It says, So Barnabas and Saul were sent out by the Holy Spirit. They went down to the seaport of Seleucia and then sailed for the island of Cyprus. There, in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogues and preached the word of God. John Mark went with them as their assistant. So during their first missionary trip, Paul and Barnabas, they bring John Mark with them. Now, we don't know a ton about John Mark other than the fact that he would go on to write the gospel of Mark, and he was beloved among most of those in the church. It's likely that he was a younger leader simply because he's an assistant or being mentored by Paul and Barnabas. But they had this great, you know, thing going on, the, the three of them going out, they're the three musketeers heading into the Roman Empire with the gospel, and things are great. But then in verse 13, things take a turn. Verse 13, chapter 13, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There, John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. Now, we aren't really sure why John Mark left. Maybe there was a sickness in the family. Maybe he just didn't want to do it anymore. Maybe he got sick and tired of Paul. Maybe he didn't like Barnabas. Maybe they didn't like him. I don't know. We don't know exactly what happened. All we know is that instead of continuing on like he had originally signed up for, he decides to head back home to Jerusalem. But based on Paul's remarks in Acts chapter 15, our passage for today, we can surmise that his leaving was not well received by Paul. Luke records that John Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas. That's a strong word. He didn't just say, hey, look, I got something going on. I got to get back home. My mother's sick. I got an emergency. I got a tea time. He didn't say any of that stuff, right? He deserted them. It's likely that he just snuck out one night and went back to Jerusalem. Little John has left a little bit of a bitter taste in Paul's mouth because of his actions. But as we get to Acts chapter 15, Barnabas seems to be in a position where he wants to give John Mark a second chance. And this is what sparks a conflict between Paul, Barney, and John Mark, right? So let's pick it up again in Acts chapter 15. Now we have some background about what's going on here. Verse 39, Luke says this, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed for Cyprus. Paul chose Silas, and as he left, the believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. Then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. This is a major relational collision. Paul and Barnabas are close friends. They are confidants. Right? They have walked together. They've supported one another through some of the most incredible losses and victories over the last few years. Barnabas was there when Paul was nearly stoned to death and cared for him. Paul was there when Barnabas and his life was on the line. He cared for him. He walked with him. They prayed with each other. They ate together. They lived their lives together. They gave everything to share the gospel together. And yet now it says they've separated. A major relational collision has happened. And this, the, the, the conflict is so sharp that it says that they part ways. Barnabas takes John Mark one way and Paul chooses a new companion, Silas, and he goes another way. So I want to ask you a question because I know you're thinking it. Whose side are you on? Who got it right? Who was right? Right? Let's think about it. On one hand, Paul has set some boundaries with John Mark, right? And he says, look, I, he, this guy can't be trusted. He deserted us at the beginning of our trip that we knew would come with all sorts of issues. And, and I just can't bring him along because I'm, I'm afraid he's going to do it again. And I have to set some boundaries. That seems sort of reasonable, right? And yet on the other hand, Barnabas seems to be extending grace and a second chance to John Mark. After all, isn't the gospel all about second chances? Yes. Ah, so whose side are you on? Let's take a vote. Let's do it. Come on. Come, no, come on. 
This is a safe place. We already decided that. Let's take a vote. How many of you are on the side of Paul? Yeah, wrong answer. Okay, we got a couple. Set some boundaries, right? How many of you are on the side of Barnabas? Oh, such loving, caring people. Such wonderful people, right? Right? Paul's side. I thought my life was over there for a second. I thought that was it. I thought Jesus came back. That was it. X15. We're done. What in the world? Oh my goodness. Maybe we shouldn't have taken a vote. Man. Whew. I got to catch my breath, man. All right. So, I don't even know what I'm doing right now. Okay. Let me take a breath. Here we go. Right. Here's the thing. You got Paul, you got Barnabas. And I mean, Paul, you know, he's kind of the, he fooled me once, right? Like, look, I just can't, I'm not going to risk my life again with a guy I can't trust. And I get that, right? And Barnabas, like, yeah, but like, man, this guy, he, he made a mistake. And we all make mistakes. We need to give him a second chance. I get that. And so the question for us really isn't who's right, but did they get it right? Did they get it right? Was, you know, the conflict that happened is like, well, yeah, that stuff happens. Did they get it right? Now, upon first reading, it makes me kind of embarrassed for Barney and Paul. I, I'm like, oh, man. I mean, couldn't they have figured this out? Th these are grown men who love Jesus. Was this so bad that they literally had to go to different parts of the world? Right? This is not one of the finer moments in the book of Acts. It doesn't place a very good light on how Christians deal with their conflict. It makes me even wonder, why would Luke include this story? I mean, Luke could have been, you know, like, hey, and then Paul went this way with Silas, and Barnabas went this way with John Mark, and left the conflict out of it. In fact, if you were trying to write a story that would convince people that this is the way you should live, which the Bible is really telling, I would not tell this story, <laughs> which is one of the things I love about the Bible. It'll tell you the truth. And the truth is you're going to have major relational collisions with those you are in close community with. And sometimes we get it right, but most of the time we get it wrong. And Luke is not a shying away from bringing this up. And I think there's a number of other good reasons why Luke includes this story about Paul and Barnabas and John Mark. But there's two that I think are really important. The first is that very fact that community really does breed conflict. Close community, it breeds conflict. And then second, he tells a story because he's pointing out there are good ways to do this and there are bad ways to do this too. So let's start with why Close community breeds conflict. The reason most of our conflict happens with those we are closest to boils down to one thing, history. We have history. We have lived life close to them. And we have the most history with the people we're closest to. You know, I don't have any history with the barista at Starbucks. So, Conflict is unlikely to happen. Maybe they irritate me, whatever, but I move on and I don't hold anything against them, right? And even if it does happen, again, like it's not going to happen. It's going to last very long. But I do have a lot of history with my wife and my kids. I do have a lot of history with my parents and my sister. And things have happened. Words have been spoken. Actions have been taken with those you're in close community with more than anyone else. And when those histories, whether they be big or small, go unresolved, conflict is bound to happen. You see, for Paul, there's history with John Mark, right? You, you get into an argument with somebody in your family, and, and you, you know there is history here that has yet to be dealt with. And Paul has that history with John Mark. Paul recognizes that, that John Mark deserted them on their most critical moments in the leg of their trip. 
And this is not the kind of thing that's forgotten very easily. Even if Paul has forgiven John Mark, he's certainly not forgotten the history that exists there. So when the possibility of John Mark joining Paul and Barnabas is brought up, history takes over. He deserted us. We never dealt with it, and I can't trust him. You know this experience, right? Right? You, you get into an argument with your spouse or your, your parent or your sister or brother, whatever, and you're, you know, something stupid like your how to load the dishwasher or something like that, right? And then you start to argue, and then before you know it, you're talking about something that happened three years prior, and you're bringing up all this history, and you're like, I can't trust you. And then you sit down, and you're like, but they just put the plates in the wrong place, right? And you're like, how did that happen? Well, you have history with these people. And it is just, it is oftentimes, it is just sitting right under the surface, ready to bubble up and cause all sorts of relational collisions in your life. And when that stuff goes unresolved, that history, man, it gets ugly in conflict. It is at the center of the majority of the conflict you have with people in your life. The conflict you have with those closest in community is the end result. Listen to this. It is the end result of you intimately sharing your lives with them. Which, by the way, is a really good thing, isn't it? In fact, this may seem a little bit controversial, but conflict, I believe, and I believe the Bible speaks to this as well, can and should be seen as a good thing. Conflict is actually a good thing. It means that you're sharing your life intimately with others, that you are loving and you are sharing and caring for other people in your life, which is how we were created to live. Not to mention the fact that in a sinful world, we need conflict. Why do we need conflict? Because we need correction oftentimes. We need stuff to change in our lives. And that doesn't usually come very easily, does it? It usually comes as a byproduct of conflict. So I don't want us to see conflict as just this really bad thing that we need to avoid. In fact, try that long enough and you'll be in all sorts of conflict, <laughs> right? Instead, it's this beautiful thing that happens in a sinful world when we get really close to each other, when we start to love each other well. The key is how we deal with the conflict in our lives. Because it's only good conflict when our shared histories are dealt with well. So let's take a different vote, okay? How many of you think Paul and Barnabas handled this situation well? Oh, good, I did a very good job convincing you, okay? How many of you think Paul and Barney could have resolved this in a much healthier manner? Yeah, they should have. So let's look at what Jesus has to say about something like this. Now, you may know this passage, you've been around the church, Matthew chapter 18. It is really a description and a prescription for how we should handle conflict with one another. These are the words of Jesus, okay? And here's what Jesus says. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. Conflict resolved. But if you're unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again, so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. If the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. Then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat that person as a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. So let's compare and contrast, shall we? Let's ask this question first. In Acts chapter 15, who is the conflict actually between? Paul and John Mark. Did you notice? John Mark is not part of the conversation. He never has a word to say. Luke gives us no indication that Paul ever spoke with John Mark about how he feels offended. In addition, there were no additional parties are invited to try and help resolve the conflict with John Mark present, and it never even gets to the point where they would go to the church for help. In the end, this conflict was dealt with very poorly by Paul. 
because he skipped the very first step in resolving conflict with someone he's close to. He never talked to John Mark. At least we have no indication that he did. He avoided the one conversation he was supposed to have from the very start, and everything fell apart from there. And not to mention, Paul has been festering at this for a while, right? I mean, the history he has with John Mark has been building inside him for months, maybe years, which is what happens to unresolved conflict with those we're in close community with, doesn't it? It just festers under the surface. It eats away at us until our hearts become hard, until we become bitter, and then maybe then we deal with it foolishly. Now, before I pile up on Paul too much here, Barnabas is not innocent in this matter either. Instead of Barnabas encouraging Paul and John Mark to work out their issues, he steps in and tries to defend John Mark without him even present. No, 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 no. Right? Neither of them, either of them, deal with this conflict in an appropriate manner, at least not a biblical Jesus-like manner. And even after they separate, that conflict still isn't resolved. They go their separate ways, but there's still a history of conflict there. If anything, that conflict has only been intensified because nobody dealt with the real issue, which is the biggest problem when conflict arises in close community. If there is unresolved conflict throughout our history, watch out. Things get ugly fast. Stuff gets said that should never have been said. Things can get ugly so quickly. All you want to do is run the other way and not deal with conflict ever again. Now, interestingly, it actually seems like this conflict between Paul and John Mark eventually gets resolved. To what degree, I don't know. But by the writing of 1 Corinthians, Paul indicates in chapter 9 that he and Barnabas are working together again. And in the book of Galatians, Paul actually talks about going to Jerusalem with Barnabas years after their conflict. In the book of Colossians, Paul makes mention of John Mark and does so in a very positive manner. And likewise, Paul even asks for John Mark's help in 2 Timothy. So eventually, somewhere along the way, they dealt with something. To what degree, we don't know. But all of this makes me wonder the question, what if? What if? What if Paul had dealt with his beef beef with John Mark directly and immediately? What if Barnabas hadn't gotten in the way of the two of them dealing with their conflict? Now, true, God would use them regardless, which I think is important to note, right? God will turn all things to good, even our poorly managed conflict. He'll use it for good. But I believe this passage actually serves as a reminder of how we are called to deal with conflict appropriately. In fact, as I think of conflict and the conflicts that I've dealt with in close community, I often wonder to myself, what if? Like, what if I would have dealt with that properly? What might have been in our relationship and the relationship of those involved if I would have done as Jesus instructs? Which is where I want us to land today. Because I want us to leave here understanding what it takes for us to deal with conflict with those we're in close community with. Because you might be in the midst of it right now. You might have a history of it lingering over your head. And if you don't have either one of those, just sit tight because it's just a matter of hours or moments before conflict will be in your path again. So let me just give us a few things to think about regarding the conflict in your life and how to deal with it in a healthy biblical manner, using this passage as sort of a case study of how not to do it, okay? So when conflict arises in close community, the first thing we have to do is seek out the source. You got to go to the source, And I know it's hard, and I know it's counterintuitive to how we usually deal with conflict, but nothing is more important to handling conflict well than actually seeking out the person or persons you're in conflict with. Don't go to anybody else. 
You know, I have to wonder what would have happened if Paul you know, would have went directly to John Mark and dealt with their issue shortly after it happened. Not only would it have been honoring to God, but I'm convinced that it would have enabled them to do even greater work through their ministry together. It would have made them better together. Which when conflict is dealt with appropriately is usually the byproduct of it. When you've dealt with conflict and you've gone to the source and you've talked it out and you've hatched it out, don't you find that when you come together again, you're better because of it? The true must have been the same for John, Mark, and Paul. It would have been. And so when conflict arises, I promise you, I promise you, you will be so tempted to go to all the wrong people to talk about it. Right? Right? You will run to your friends, you'll run to your spouse, you'll, you'll run to your coworkers, and you'll do it all in the name of venting. I'm just, I just got to get this off my chest. Wrong person, right? Wrong person. When the temptation comes, pause and remember to seek out the source. Some people will tell me, well, I just needed to talk it through. No, you didn't. You know what to do. You know what to do. You know where to go. Stop going to the wrong people. You'll only breed other kinds of conflicts. You'll only make it worse. Go to the person who wronged you or that you have wronged. Don't sidestep this. You'll be tempted. I know you will. I am too. Suppress it. Put it away. Pray in that moment. God, give me the strength to go to the source. Second, pursue peace. If we want to handle conflict well in close community, we got to pursue peace. Paul says these words in Romans 12, 18, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Do all that you can. In other words, when conflict arises in close community, follow the instructions of Jesus. Just try it sometime. Just try it and see what happens. Pursue peace with them in every way that you are able to. And hopefully through doing that, the conflict will resolve itself and you'll be able to move forward in your relationship. You'll be better for it. But even if it doesn't end in peace, do everything you can based on the scriptures to pursue it. Because unfortunately, we have little control over the results of dealing with conflict. The only thing we really have control over is the role that we're going to play in it. And in Matthew 18, it calls us to walk in faith towards resolving conflict and pursuing peace faithfully. And if it doesn't end in the kind of resolution that you had hoped for, that's okay. You don't get to control that outcome. So long as you played the part that you're called to, to pursue peace at all costs, as much as it depends on you. And then last thing, and I cannot emphasize this enough. Church, I'm going to tell you this right now. We are really bad at this, okay? And we got to get better at it if we want to be healthy. We got to get better at redirecting resolution. Here's what I mean by that. My guess is that you've been part of someone, or, you know, been part of someone going to the wrong person to deal with the conflict, Right? You were all of a sudden the third person in the conflict. You never asked to be the third person. You just were invited into it unwillingly. And in sociology, we refer to this as triangulation, right? We create this triangle of relationships. So the concept is simple. Person A and person B have a conflict with each other, right? But instead of going to person B, they go over here to person C, And they create this triangle of conflict. And instead of redirecting person A to person B, person C just gets wrapped up in the conflict. And before long, they're like, I don't want to be part of this anymore. Or like on the part of Barnabas, they go to person B and they start defending person A. Y'all been a part of this before? You've probably been a part of it. You've probably created it. I'm telling you, the scriptures tell us, avoid this at all costs. You will never solve the conflict that you're trying to deal with by going to person C, by trying to go to someone else. And if you end up becoming that person, the most loving, compassionate thing you can say is you are talking to the wrong person. I'm going to tell you right now, as a pastor, I have probably said those words 
8,946 times. It's true. So many people want to come to me to deal with conflict they have with someone else. You're talking to the wrong person. Now listen, if you go to somebody and you try to deal with it and it doesn't work out, you can come talk to me and bring me along. That's what the Bible instructs. But don't come to me first. You're not going to like what I have to say. And the truth is that we, as a close community, need to be willing to say the same things to our friends. If you come and talk to me about person B, hey, I love you, I care about you, you you're talking to the wrong person. You need to go talk to that person. Redirect the resolution. It's the most loving, caring, gracious thing you can do in that moment. It is for the betterment of them. It is for the betterment of you. Don't get wrapped up in that garbage, right? None of us need more drama in our lives. It's not even ours. Redirect the resolution. Look, here's the thing. I'll say it again. Conflict is not bad when it's dealt with properly right? Quite the opposite. Conflict actually shows us the depth of our love and grace for one another. We can expect it. And when it comes, Jesus says, here's how I want you to deal with it. This is how you grow. This is how relationships are resolved. This is how they, how relationships grow and flourish in the midst of conflict. It creates healthy relationships and strengthens the community at large, especially within the church. But we have to deal with it properly. We have to go to the source. We have to pursue peace. And when it happens, we got to redirect resolution in the right direction. Just like our creator dealt with the conflict we have between him and us. I always say this. It's my, Jesus never asked us to do something he didn't already do himself. He saw the conflict that we have between him and our sin and our rebellion and decided, I'm going to the source. I am going directly to them. And he came to us in human form to resolve the conflict we have with our God and our creator. In Romans 5.8, it says, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were still in conflict with him, while we were still in rebellion against him. He came to us. He didn't do an end around. He didn't go talk to his friends. He came directly to us to us. And the end result of his resolution to our conflict was this, Romans 5, 11. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Man, if that shit doesn't spur us on to want to deal with conflict in a healthy manner, I don't know what will. Our God came to us to build a new relationship with him, to resolve the conflict between us, and then to invite us into his family and call us his children and his friends. And so when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you move from being an enemy of God, in conflict with God, to becoming a friend of God, because Jesus didn't shy away from dealing with the conflict between us and him. So here's what I'm calling you to today. Let's walk in Jesus' footsteps. And when conflict arises, we go to the source. In a loving, caring, gracious manner, we have that hard conversation. And we pursue peace as much as it depends on us. And if people come to us and they try to wrangle us and get us involved, we say, look, you're talking to the wrong person. I love you. You need to go talk to the right person. To listen to the words of Jesus, to follow his instructions, but more importantly, to follow his example that he would give us a new relationship with God through him because he didn't shy away with dealing with the conflict that existed between us and him. Let's walk in his footsteps, friends. Let's pray. God, we thank you. We thank you that you don't leave us to wander and try to figure this stuff out, but you even gave us case studies in the scriptures as to how to not do it. And you give us instructions and divinely ordained words from Jesus in Matthew 18 as to how. Lord, as conflict arises in our lives, we know that it's going to be tempting. We're going to want to shove it deep inside of us and ignore it and avoid it, or we're going to want to go to our friends or our family members and talk to them. And I pray that you would give us the courage, you would give us the love and compassion to do the right thing, 
to go to the right person, to pursue peace. As much as it depends on us, God, whether the result is as we want it or not, that we would pursue peace as much as it depends on us. And God, that when we get caught in triangulation and God, that we would have the words and the courage to say, you're talking to the wrong person. Well, let me, let me point you in the right direction. God, thank you for coming to us in the midst of our conflict with you. Thank you for loving us so much that you wouldn't do an end around. You wouldn't avoid it. You didn't, you know, you didn't pretend like it didn't exist, but instead you came directly to us and you dealt with the conflict between us and you. You gave your life so that we might have a new relationship with you. And so I'm, I'm asking you, God, by your spirit, may it rest upon us and fill us as we leave this place that we would walk in your footsteps, that the conflict that arises in our lives would be dealt with in a healthy, honoring manner, and that it would bring our communities that we are closest to closer and closer together, God. May you be glorified in how we deal with this. May you be glorified in how we walk in your footsteps. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.